Is there any difference between the enclosures that you use and the enclosures that you breed in? No, um, you know, all of our snakes, there are pets first. And I really mean that in every way, you know, we our, our brettles pythons, we've tried to breed them now, this is the second year, they have no interest. And I think it's just a cycling thing, but they're still our pets. Um, yeah. You know, even snakes that we bought with the intention of breeding them, if they never want to breed, they're still our pets. They're not going anywhere. The smaller snakes should not be put into larger enclosures because you're going to stress them out. And I know you've had lots of experience with this. So maybe you could kind of walk through why that is more of a myth than anything. Yeah, so I think I, I think that the biggest stumbling block with the cage size conversation is that we talk about the size, but um, we discuss less about how to fill that space. You know, she she tail whipped me. They definitely do that. That was not an exaggeration when people talked about them tail whipping. <laughs> um, and it's a lot of weight behind that tail whip. She can really get you. Um, but she, she's very dramatic when you initially take her out, she'll flatten her whole body. It's not even just the hood, it's like her whole body pancakes. Welcome to episode number 88 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you very much for tuning in today. Make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com if you're looking for more information on the show. You can also find links to the Animals at Home store if you are interested in picking up a new t-shirt or sweater. $5 for every t-shirt or sweater is automatically donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. Also, in the last couple of months, I have started a Patreon account. So if you are interested in having early access to episodes or the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests, make sure you head to patreon.com slash animals at home. And thank you very much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. You can find affiliate links in both the YouTube description as well as the show notes. So if you are looking for any new reptile equipment, I highly recommend going to check them out. And of course, if you do buy something, a small commission does come to me at no extra cost to you, which in turn supports the podcast. All right, so let's jump into today's episode. Today, I'm speaking with Chelsea is Daner of Smoldering Serpents. You may have seen Smoldering Serpents on both Facebook and Instagram. They have quite a large following there. Smoldering Serpents is a small snake breeding operation ran by both Chelsea and her husband, Andrew. They have a very wide range of species that they keep. And as Chelsea explains in the podcast, they really narrow in the animals that they're going to keep based off what they're looking for. They actually want to keep animals that they're interested in. And as she says, they are all pets first and breeders second. So in the episode, Chelsea runs through a lot of the species that they work with. She talks about how their care has evolved over time. Specifically, we cover two, I think, really important things. The first is enclosure size. It's something that we've talked about on the podcast before, but specifically talking about putting small snakes in large enclosures and whether or not that is okay to do and how to do it successfully. And we also discuss how to have success breeding using complex cages. So it doesn't matter what the animal is, either a pet or a breeder, all of Chelsea and Andrew's animals are kept within the same type of advanced enriching enclosure. So Chelsea walks us through some tips for how they have success to make sure their animals are healthy and thriving while using complex environments. We also discuss the DIY cages that Chelsea and Andrew have built. They're really fascinating. They look amazing. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see her backdrop is the cages that they've made. If you're just listening to this, then in the show notes, I have her Instagram and Facebook. There you can find photos of their setups because they are quite nice. I really do think that the setup that they have over at Smoldering Serpents is a great template for the hobbyist that wants to get into keeping on a semi-large scale, you know, having 40 or 50 different animals and several different species, and simultaneously wants to have a few breeding projects on the go, but isn't overly concerned about making a ton of money. I think this is the type of hobbyist that we want to be expanding. We want to have more of these in the hobby, similar to what we talked about with TC, and this is probably even on a smaller scale. You know, this is almost micro batch breeding rather than small batch breeding reading. So let's jump into the episode. I hope you enjoy. I will talk to you after. Chelsea, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for asking me. It's nice to chat with another Manitoban. I think, you know, it's weird. The reptile hobby is so big and most of it is tilted, especially online towards the American side. And yes. I think people <laughs> don't realize what it's like to be in Canada than also insular in Manitoba. Like it's quite insular. So it's not the same. It's not like you can just run to the no. store and buy your equipment and, you know, it's a much smaller culture. So how did you get into reptiles living in Manitoba? Um, well, as you know, um, <clears throat> Manitoba is kind of famous for our garter snakes. So yep. growing up, it was always garter snakes. Um, I don't think I found any other species of snake until I was in my 20s. So, um, 
Yeah, I would catch garter snakes, keep them for a couple of weeks, um, learn what they like to eat, learn, you know, I always love watching them swim around. I'd give them some land and some water and make them a little home and then I'd let them go. But um, yeah, it was mostly just our garters. And um, I was in my 20s the first time I went in a pet shop and I saw a ball python, an adult ball python sitting there. And I I had reptiles growing up. I had... Um, <clears throat> Crested geckos, <clears throat> sorry, I was talking my throat. <laughs> uh, crested geckos, I had a leopard gecko, and the thought never crossed my mind that I could own snakes. I don't know why, but um, yeah, I saw the ball python and I asked about it, and something just clicked in my head where I, <laughs> I realized that there were more snakes out there than our garter snakes. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to learn more about them. So when you say you obviously you're catching garter snakes and yeah, in Manitoba, they're pretty easy to find, especially if you're outside of the city, yeah. you're going to find one. But you said in your twenties, did you find mm-hmm. other species of snake in Manitoba? Did you find a hog I nose? Did. Or, yeah. What'd you no, find? I never found a hog nose. I really Damn. tried. Um, I found, uh, I lived in the country for a while and I found, um, a couple red bellies, which mm. is really exciting. I did not know we had those there. Um, and I found uh, a green snake, which okay. I think is a smooth green snake up there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So. Yeah. And those are much harder to find. And, and especially yeah. the hog nose is like a, an elusive snake. I know somebody who found one, I think, last year or the year before, but they are very difficult to find. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, I went up to Spruce Woods there, that little pocket where we have um, our prairie skinks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I found those, which is exciting. Oh, cool. Um, but yeah, I was looking for the hog noses. I've never found them. <laughs> So once you saw the ball python in the pet store, did you buy that that snake? Did you take no, it home? no, oh, okay. No, so it was it was a reptile rescue uh, in Winnipeg, and uh, I was there with family, and we were kind of browsing around, looking at all the all the animals, and I saw this ball python sitting there. Uh, they also had a, uh, an adult merrells, and I was looking between these two snakes, and of course they're much bigger than our garter snakes, so. I was looking at these two snakes and just kind of, I was so interested in them and I just didn't know anything about them. So I actually came back by myself and asked to hold them. And uh, there was a pet shop next door that had baby ball pythons. And I don't know. It was just the first time I saw them. I just, something just clicked where I couldn't get enough of them. <laughs> so this could not have been that long ago then. No, it was not. <laughs> no, that okay. was, uh, that was, about six years ago. Okay. When I, yeah, when I first saw that ball python and I was like, this looks like an animal I need to learn about. <laughs> I'm always fascinated when I see someone with you who has this you know, beautiful collection behind you and anyone will obviously put the show notes in for your Instagram and Facebook. People can go look and especially, you know, I look at your collection, I think this is somebody that must be in the hobby for her whole life. And then, but then as you're telling, I can tell that, you know, this must only be a yeah. few years because I know exactly what pet shop and which rescue you're talking yeah. about and the rescue's <laughs> yeah. not there anymore. So that, so that, that's really interesting. So, so then what was the first snake that you brought home? A ball python. Oh, okay. Um, I, I got some suggestions from the, from the rescue, um, of a local breeder in Winnipeg and I sent him a message and he's a really nice guy. And I, I just said, I'm basically looking for a pet. I've just fallen in love with them. And he showed me this little, I don't know how much you know about morphs, ball pythons. I'm not, not very much into it, but he showed me this little GHI female who's just beautiful. And uh, I went and I got her as soon as she was ready. So that's how it started. That is how it started. And the second, you know, catching garter snakes is very different than feeling a ball python. And the second I held her, there was just something like, I just, my interest just grew and grew and grew the more I learned about them. So So, uh, when you picked up the snake from the breeder, did you, how did you set it up? Like, can you tell me a little bit about the initial setup you did? Yeah. So I actually, uh, when I initially went to that reptile shop with my family and I went home and I was thinking about it. Um, I actually went on to Reddit and I found the snake community there and I just read everything they had to offer. And thankfully that community was already pushing for better uh, care standards. So I was directed basically um, to uh, animal plastics cage. I got a four by two by one cage. I set it up with the radiant heat panel and filled it up uh, to the brim with plants and hides and everything, branches. And, and I put her in there and I just kind of crossed my fingers and, and she was great. She 
she never missed a meal. She was so happy in there. <laughs> so you got off onto uh, the right foot for the most part then as far as care goes. I did. Yeah. Um, so I kind of just started there because that's what was presented to me. I actually wasn't even aware of rat keeping or any other style of keeping really initially. Um, so when I met my husband uh, through the Reddit snake community, um, so he was That's awesome, using by the way. That, yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so he was using racks. He had a lot more snakes than I had at the time. Um, bigger racks than what's usually recommended. But, um, you know, it's kind of the same situation with him where that's kind of where he was directed. So that's where he went initially. Um, and then the two of us together, we kind of, we figured things out pretty quickly as we added snakes to different enclosures. It's kind of um, where you start off is thankfully not where you end up. <laughs> yes. So. And, and that's the point, right? It, it doesn't really matter yeah. where you start as long as your yeah. your goal is to progress. So then as far as your, the animals that you had in Manitoba, what did you have before you moved down to North Carolina? Yeah. So I had my ball python uh, pretty shortly after that. Um, it, you know, it's when she would go into shed for two, three weeks at a time. And I would be sitting there twiddling my fingers going, man, I miss her. <laughs> and uh, I kind of thought, you know, I'm loving her so much. I kind of like another one. So um, through talking to uh, that reptile rescue, uh, he directed me to looking into bread lie. And uh, I was already talking to my now husband, then a uh, friend who he had three bread lie already. So he was like, yeah, you should get a bread lie. <laughs> so, um, so I ended up getting one from, uh, from Don up in uh, BC, I think he is. And he, um, he was a fantastic snake. Uh, his name was Scooter. And, uh, and then before I moved, I ended up getting a little Japanese rat snake as well. And so those are my three that I had before I moved. And, and then, then when you moved, did they have to stay in Canada? Two of them did. Um, I was told when I looked into uh, importing, I was told in no uncertain terms that the uh, scooter, the Brattles Python would not be coming with me. There was no way to get him over the border. Um, and Paisley, the ball python was like astronomically expensive to get over the border. And I already had a couple friends who I knew would give her a good home. So I found her a good home and, and uh, Jinx, the Japanese rat snake came with me. Okay. So you're able to bring one and then you had to rehome two? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because it is insanely expensive to bring animals across. It is. It is. Yeah. <laughs> so so then once you moved to North Carolina, the, the collection that your husband had, is it similar to what is you guys have now or has it expensive? Like what did he have when you introduced yourself yeah. there? So, so when we met, he had the most notable for me were his three bread lie because I just loved them so much. Yeah. Um, he also had two black milks, which is another species that I was planning on getting before I moved. And then I just didn't bother since I knew I'd be moving. Um, and uh, those two species actually are kind of what brought us together, the black milks and the brettles. Um, he had a lot of king snakes, um, littler, littler species. Um, but yeah, I mean, looking around, I'm sitting in my room here. I have cages in front of me, too. I'm sitting looking around and it's it's changed quite a bit. Um, we still have a couple of the Baird's rats. He had them already, um, the Russian rats, but it's kind of, you know, there's some growing pains with combining, um, what two people would like, but it's also been really fun because we've discovered new species together, um, through keeping them different ways. You know, the, the, the black milks, they're fairly terrestrial. Um, so being in a rack. It, it didn't feel like they might be missing out on too many different behaviors, but now I'm looking at them over to my right here. Um, they're in uh, six by two by 18 inch cages and they're all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've given them some nice big shells with hides up there. They're off the ground all the time. So between the two of us figuring these things out and, and finding new species that we're both really excited about, um, you know, there's some familiar familiar faces with snakes who have been here long before I was. But um, yeah, we've we've shaped our. Um, I was gonna say collection. I don't usually say the word collection. It's, it feels weird. If you our have another family, word, <laughs> yeah, family. I, I know. Usually but, say our, our group of snakes or our family yeah. of snakes or something. Um, 
yeah, it's it's definitely evolved over the years. <laughs> well, and what I like, I know I use the collection, the word collection a lot because it's just I can't find a better word. And for yeah. the, I know people, <laughs> you know, it's like collecting baseball cards. Well, I mean, the second definition is uh, a group of things. So yes, it, it does yeah. actually work. But anyway, it, the, what I like about your collection is it is very eclectic. It has, you know, you have several different species. It's not overly focused on one thing. And, and in some ways, it's funny, you know. I think many people in the hobby, their significant other is not really involved with it. So when you have another significant other, it's almost like a perfect storm where it could go, it could expand yeah. like crazy. Like yeah. you, have, you don't have the other person saying, no, maybe you shouldn't get another snake. It's, so I'm sure that's a lot of fun though. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. We've, uh, um, so one of my favorite species that we've found after the fact are our uh, neotropical bird eating snakes. Um, the, I usually just refer to them with their scientific name, Phrynonax Um, They're pretty uncommon uh, in captivity, but we came across them and both of us were just like, we got to figure out more about these guys. <laughs> they're, so, they're so interesting, their behavior that we were seeing. Um, we found not too many, but a couple of videos of them from the wild and uh, they're beautiful and just really interesting. But um, you know, when we latched onto them was the first time I think that I've actually felt like if I had the room, I might have a dozen of the same species. <laughs> but I really, I like the, the, the diversity. Like we have a couple of species where we have maybe a trio. Um, I think we have two species where we have four, four of them. But other than that, it's just singles or pairs. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a, it's a really nice looking group of animals. It's, you know, you, especially you have a few sort of collages on, on I think on Instagram mm-hmm. or Facebook, so you can sort of see it all. So tell me a little bit about the you've already kind of alluded to it or touched on it is that that progression process from you know moving from racks to mo- moving to larger enclosures. So what did that process? How did you guys get involved in advancing that? Like was it just sort of instinctual or what was the process there? Part of it was that because I had kind of started off on a better foot with the advice that I had gotten. Um, Part of it was that while I didn't have an immediate um, overly negative reaction to seeing racks, um, I had also already seen, you know, what a ball python does when you give it space. Um, I had seen my bread life stretched out across, you know, his branches and and my little Japanese rat snake. I mean, I can thank him for getting me into colubrids (laughs) and knowing how active snakes can be because the second I saw that little 20 gram snake, I was just a goner <laughs> watching watching him climb around his huge cage was so much fun um and they're such a beautiful species they're unbelievable <laughs> um i think actually the snake the snake who pushed us the most to transitioning was actually our baron's racer who's back in that cage there um rosalind so she was a baby when i came around and she had not been a very good eater and she was in a rack it was an oversized rack for her size, but of course you can't give any height or anything, no overhead heat in a rack. So, um, so we're having difficulties with her, could not really get her to thrive. So uh, we had an extra 10 gallon tank that we threw together. We put some branches in there, we set a light on top, gave her a nice warm basket spot and put her in there. And it took all of a couple weeks and she was striking off tongs. She was following our fingers. She was just a totally different animal. And, uh, and I think that kind of opened our eyes to the fact that, you know, even the ones who, who seem content, um, you know, they seem content. I don't actually believe they are, but they seem content in a very minimalist setup they have so much more to them if you give them the option and bring that out. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's been, it's been a continuous process of opening our eyes. Um, You know, when, when you look at a Baron's racer, it's pretty obvious they're a very active snake that likes to climb. Um, And so then I started when people would ask me about cage sizing, cage setups, I would start saying things like, um, you know, I don't, I don't like racks except for very terrestrial species. Uh, except then we started moving like our king snakes to two foot tall cages with shelves and branches. And all of a sudden I was seeing our speckled king um, preferring to sit way off the ground all the time and climbing our branches. And, you know, it's just, it's like this slow process of coming around fully to realizing that 
for me personally, I just, I can't, um, I can't really see any species that I would keep permanently in a rack at this point. Um, I, you know, I used to make exceptions, but at this point, every snake I make an exception for, I've kind of seen the opposite when I, you know, give them a good size cage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the, the animal sort of proves you wrong. And it's funny yeah, as, you're, yeah. as you're speaking about this, like I hear, you know, as, as far as attacking racks go, you, you know, I'll, I'll have people that will come and say, well, okay, what if the rack had, you know, two feet of height and lighting and, you know, it was long and it, like, well, you're just describing a, a better enclosure. That's right. all. <laughs> it's like right. You could define exactly. what's behind you as a rack. But, yeah, exactly. And so it's kind of funny. It's like, yes, when you provide the space, they use it. When you provide the enrichment, they use it. And, and so it's just, yeah, as you watch the animals use it, it's impossible to regress back to a rack system. It really is. We have, um, I know that, you know, we, we use racks for new hatchlings and it, that won't change. Um, I'm not actually anti-rack in certain uh, situations. We've, we've raised babies in different ways. And I, I do believe that using our hatchling racks have given the best results. Mm -hmm. And I know people will disagree with that, but I, I base it on the welfare of the animals and how well they're establishing themselves. Um, and that's about it. Um, yeah. You know, we, I, I still use racks where the tubs are more than the length of the baby. And, and I give them, I feel it as much as I can. Um, but um, other than that, I mean, I just, we still have some of our racks that we haven't gotten rid of yet. And I just look at them and I, I can't think of any snake, even our little, you know, three foot long king snakes. I can't think of a snake I'd want to put back in there. Yeah. Well, and it's just so much more exciting for you as the keeper as it well. Is. It and is. So, yeah. so one area that I really wanted to touch on was this enclosure size kind of debate, because, you know, this is something where it is still somewhat of a myth that I think it's getting better, though. It's, it's sort of floating in herpetoculture where smaller snakes should not be put into larger enclosures because you're going to stress them out. And I know you've had lots of experience with this. So maybe you can kind of walk through why that is more of a myth than anything. Yeah. So I think, I, I think that the biggest stumbling block with the cage size conversation is that we talk about the size, but um, we discuss less about how to fill that space. Right. Um, because, you know, the reality is I, I, I look at around at some of my cages here and even a four by two by two cage, there's a lot of space in there. Um, a lot of open air and, and learning how to fill that space um, is something that I've been working on, you know, coming up with new ways on how to fill the space and how to make it usable. Because one way I've described it is, you know, if, if, if you, a person is standing in a six by six room, uh, it doesn't matter if the room is 50 feet tall or 10 feet tall. If yeah. there's nothing on top of you for you to use that space, it's not doing you any good. So for me, what I've been working on um, is trying to make the enclosure more three-dimensional. Um, I have shelves in all of my cages that are big enough to put hides up there. Um, when I put branches in, I really, uh, it, it, make, it, it can make it a little harder to get the snake out of the cage, but yeah. that's not my top priority. Um, but I really try to make the branching three-dimensional towards the front of the cage too, so that there's as little useless air as possible. So. So when you're putting a smaller snake in a cage like that, of course, that also means that it can be harder to find them. Um, but what I've, what I've found over and over again is if you're giving good hiding spots and you just give the snake a couple weeks to settle in, they're going to find their spots. And um, I found this, so we have a younger black milk snake. Um, she's 2019 and she's fairly small and, and I moved her to her adult cage not that long ago and it's it's a six by two cage and i filled it to the top with stuff and i kind of put her in there and i said okay see you nova i will never see you again <laughs> like, i'm never gonna find the snake again because they also burrow a lot right. which is especially hard to find but you know i know exactly where she's sitting now if i go and open the cage i know which piece of cork she likes the best and she'll probably be under there and um and I think that um, trying to put yourself, it kind of sounds a little weird, but trying to put yourself in the 
the snake's mind of being a small creature in this relatively large cage and trying to make sure you have little nooks and crannies for them to to hide in. And um, I can't really think of a snake that we've had an issue with moving to a big cage mm-hmm. when when we've really filled it up. Well, and I think what you're saying is, you know, using the space wisely. And I think I, what I really like about your enclosures is the the branch work that you throw in. Like I can see behind you and I'll put that in the pictures in the show notes for people is like, you just have a lot of almost like smaller sort of like maybe half inch diameter type wood and just like in there. So it's just almost like a bush rather than trees. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was, that was, um, um, I know you've had Francis on the podcast. So that was his cages were uh, a big part in, in helping me realize uh, the best way to put branches in there to be usable because, mm-hmm. um, and there are certain snakes. I mean, uh, you can see over my shoulder there, that's my ball python enclosure. And he has more just big, thick horizontal branches, but for something like the rat snakes, um, they kind of want to sprawl and yeah. uh, they're very good at climbing so when I would see some of Francis's enclosures and it just kind of, you know, at first glance, it just kind of looks like a mess of branches. And, yeah. and uh, I'm, I'm actually, um, I'm an artist uh, is what I do for a living. So I like to look at a cage and I like to make it look really pretty in a certain way. And I love big, thick branches. But what I started to realize was that um, that's not always the most useful for the snakes. So intertwining can be a bit of an adventure getting them to fit into the cages, but intertwining these branches into that kind of web gives them a comfortable platform to sit on Mm -hmm. and use. Yeah, it's sort of more replicating almost like a tree, like the top of a tree where you have a tree branching out and that's where they're going to hang out. That's where they're going to bask. And so as far as what about as far as lighting and heating goes, obviously with the moving away from tubs, you're going to be moving towards halogen lighting and UV and whatnot. Was that part of this process as well? Well, and how did that get folded in? Yeah. So, um, so again, the Baron's racer was the first real, uh, hint at overhead lighting and the difference that that makes. Um, and, uh, we still use, uh obviously heat tape for the hatchling racks and they do find it just fine i mean they they're exceptional at seeking out heat Mm -hmm. um but um the way you know the way that they go and sit under a halogen uh as opposed to having to dig under the ground to find the underbelly heat um again i don't i feel like i'm probably a bit more moderate with my opinion on things like i i don't really I, I feel like I tend to be a little more in the middle of things mm. than than other people because I, I I try to listen to my snakes and go by their behavior, right? So when I see the snake using the overhead lighting right away, I can't argue with that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like they're telling me what they like. That's their preference. Um, what's interesting about these cages is they actually have both overhead and underbelly and it's not, it wasn't actually on purpose, but because of the way they're stacked, Mm. um, the cage above gets a slight warm spot on the floor from the cage below. From the the ball below. Yeah, exactly. So what's interesting is snakes like our king snakes will actually use that warm spot under, underneath, uh, as well as using the overhead. So they go back and forth. Um, and meanwhile, species like the rat snakes rarely touch the ground and seem to just want to bask under the halogen. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a process, um, figuring out what, in, and it's not on a species level either. There's individual snakes who like different things. Yeah. Um, so we kind of try to cater everyone's setup to them specifically. <laughs> well, and this is where watching your animals is key. It's crucial. You have to be able to know each individual and learn what each species likes or else you'll be totally missing the point. Exactly. Yeah. So do you, do you guys have a, a template for what size, like a minimum enclosure size for, for animals? What do you use? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We usually try to aim for something that is roughly the length of a snake. Okay. So, um, and this, again, this, this depends on the exact species because, uh, we have a false water cobra. Um, she could get up to seven plus feet long. That's not the same amount of snake as, um, you know, we have some VVBs, some, some Vietnamese blue beauties. 
um, who are like half tail, yes, <laughs> yeah. long skinny tail. So, um, if the, if the snakes are a little more slender, I'll usually, you know, you can, I think the VBBs are planning on putting in seven foot cages. So it might end up being slightly less than their length. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, the false water cobra is such a girthy animal and she's extremely active. So she's actually right now, plan- we're planning to put her in a 14 foot cage Oh wow! because, you know, you, you start with the length as a rough guide, but again, going off the individual animals, um, it's, it, there is no real rule that works for all of them. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was actually like a, a video that I had made a couple months ago. And at the end of the year was talking about, you know, the girth size of the snakes you use the, if you use the length, it sort of leaves out that girth and you might have your, you're making the enclosure way too small for some right. species. Yeah. And so you, you want to make sure you're including that. And yeah, for a species like uh, a, a false water cobra, those things are crazy. <laughs> like when I see yeah. them moving around, they're just like running <laughs> yeah. almost. Yeah. Yeah. She would. Yeah. She was only, she was probably two feet long when we got her and I put her, put her in a four by two cage and it took a month and I was like, that's too small. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. So as far as moving baby snakes from tubs to larger enclosures, are there any tips that you have for people? Is there anything that you do specifically or is it just kind of introduce it and it, it seems to work out well? Um, yeah. So in theory, um, I wouldn't personally have a problem putting a baby snake right into its full size enclosure. Uh, I'm okay searching around for them as long as I know the enclosure is tight and they can't get out. Yes, uh, yeah. I'm okay having to search for them. But in general, for people who um, maybe haven't done it too many times before, I do suggest working their way up with at least one, you know, middle step. <laughs> um, getting used to and letting the snake get used to a complex enclosure that's not completely oversized. Um, so, you know, for some of my baby rat snakes, uh, 20 gallons, a great size. Um, so, and it lets you practice filling up the space too. Exactly. Um, the, the thing is looking at a, a six foot cage and having to fill that up fully. That's a, that's a whole project. <laughs> yeah. And, and the step will allow you to actually learn what kind of furniture the snake likes, you know, you, exactly. you end up putting all this together and the snake doesn't use it all. You could have, you know, use it on a micro scale. So yeah, a, a step is definitely helpful. So one, one post that you made on Facebook and then you, I think you posted it on AHH, which was great, was the, the, the photo of your enclosures. And you just said, can you tell which ones are breeding enclosures and which ones are, you know, just their, their habitats. And I thought that was such a good you know, it just perfectly highlighted what can be done in the hobby. So can you talk a little bit about that? You Is there any difference between the enclosures that you use and the enclosures that you breed in? No. Um, you know, all of our snakes, there are pets first. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I really mean that in every way, you know, we our, our brettles, pythons, we've tried to breed them. Now this is the second year. They have no interest. And I think it's just a cycling thing, but they're still our pets. Um, you know, even snakes that we bought with the intention of breeding them, if they never want to breed, they're still our pets. They're not going anywhere. Um, so, uh, to me, there, to me, there's no difference in the animals, whether they reproduce or not. So, um, while, while I temporarily use, uh, less than ideal cages just to get the babies established. Um, I, I don't really make any exception for breeding otherwise. Um, you know, the, the only thing I will say is that it, it is nice to have more minimal enclosures available to use for pairing sometimes just because mm-hmm. I don't like leaving the snakes together for too long. So just to get the business done and then, <laughs> and then go back to their homes. But other than that, I mean, um, I really, I really have to wonder some of the reproductive issues that we see in snakes in captivity. Um, I really have to wonder if it is a result of being kept in such minimalist setups. Um, The muscle tone I've seen on our snakes when they can climb all day and they can use vertical space, I can see the difference. Yeah. So, you know, something like egg binding, when I see these females sitting curled up in a coil their entire lives with nothing to do, I got to wonder, you know, how strong are they, (laughs) you know? Um, But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. 
my black notes are chasing each other around right now <laughs> um, <laughs> in their big cages and they get the job just fine done just fine even in oversized cages complex cages um do and you there have you any, have, is, is everything uh, an egg layer? Do you have any live birth? No live birthers. We were uh, intending to breed our demerals, but mm. we just kind of, you know, after thinking about it, we just kind of realized um, we had a young male who neither of us were really bonding with. You get that sometimes. We just weren't clicking with him. Um, and our, we love our female. And we just kind of sat down and had a discussion. Um, do we actually want to breed these? Because you don't have to breed everything you own. <laughs> so really? um, yeah. Yeah, right? Some people don't know. Yeah. I know, I know. Um, yeah, so that was the one that we intended to breed that would have been a live birther. But uh, we ended up finding him a good home. And mm. so we're just dealing with eggs now. But Because um, that might be one scenario where a complex habitat could yes. be an issue for birth. Yes. Yes. So that is one, that is probably the biggest concern, um, that I have for anything that could go wrong. Um, so with that, uh, we make sure that the females cages where they'll, where they'll be laying, uh, don't have any nooks or crannies that would, uh, prevent me from removing the clutch safely. Um, for example, our female birds just had a prelay shed. So, we actually removed any of her elevated hides that are really constricted that I might not be able to pull the clutch out of. And we kind of directed her to having a lot of um, hiding spots that are very easy to remove. Um, gave her a nice big lay box, but sometimes they decide they don't want to use that. <laughs> but yeah. just make sure that there's no possible place for her to lay where the eggs wouldn't be removable. But yeah, that's probably the biggest concern I'd have. Yeah. And then as far as your goals with with your breeding operation are like you said you don't have to breed everything you have and so how, what are you laying out like what species are you deciding to breed and how are you deciding to breed those ones so basically um we we want to breed a species that's in high demand because i don't want to put more animals out there when there aren't homes waiting for them exactly so um things like russian rats um bears rats uh like the black milks, I don't really, I don't keep a waiting list or anything ahead of time because I don't, I don't want to let anyone down or, you know, if something goes wrong. Um, but they would all be spoken for before they're even laid if I would let them be. And that, and that is good to me because that first of all means that they're wanted. And second of all means that we can be choosy with our homes and find nice. really good homes. Um, so yeah, the, the, market for them is a big is a big one for a couple reasons um and it's not about getting them out sooner because you know we we kept a couple babies until they were six to eight months old the last season just because a good home didn't come along so we didn't we weren't going to let them go mm -hmm. so that's fine um there's no problem with that but um it's also a species that we're really passionate about and we just think there should be more of them you know, every time I take our Russian rat snakes out, I just fall in love with them all over again. <laughs> yeah, they are amazing species. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah. So how do you get your finger on the pulse as far as the market goes? What do you do? You do anything specific to figure out what's in demand? Well, it's actually I, I say what's in demand. But what I actually mean is what's in demand within the part of the community that I'd like to sell to. Mm. Um, so, you know, people who keep the way we do um, with their animals welfare the priority these are the people who um are seeking out things like russian rats who are a lot of fun to keep in a in a huge cage right. so you know i know there are a lot of other snakes that are in high demand but typically the demand is coming from you know more chasers or <laughs> someone who wants to put them in a drawer so yeah see that's an interesting concept you're looking for people who are going to do the right thing with inside herpetoculture which is yeah, such yeah. A, that, that's such a great way to go about it look for the people that are going that you know that you're going to give even if they buy just one snake they're going to set it up in the way that we all hope that they would yeah yeah that's actually you know that's one of the funny things that you know there's a couple of things when you get into the reptile world that you're kind of it's such a it's such a norm that you don't really question it until you have a reason to and the one thing that I started realizing once we were breeding snakes is <laughs> breeders selling in pairs only mm -hmm. or selling females for more money. It's to me, it's such an encouragement of unnecessary breeding. Uh, I mean, inbreeding too, obviously. 
but yeah. also um it's you know if someone wants a female snake as a pet it kind of forces them to buy a male they didn't really want um so when we sell our babies males females are priced the same there's i prefer not to sell in pairs um but it, yeah. it's it's encouraging when I kind of try to find the right customer base who I know will take care of their snakes really well is they are just largely singles. They're just buying single snakes as a pet. And I love that. Yeah. It, you know, they be, the snake becomes a member of the family, um, which is what I hope for all of our snakes, all of our hatchlings. So as far as goals go with smoldering ser- serpents, is that, that's more, I guess it's not like, as far as an income business, it's, it's, it's not something that you're trying to generate into a, a huge thing. It's more so sort of the niche, sort of small batch style, adding adding good species to the market to people mm-hmm. who are going to do the right things with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we have a couple species that we love breeding. Like we have a pair of Honduran milk snakes and we love them and we love breeding them. Um, but sometimes the, the market for them is not as crazy as with the black milks or something mm-hmm. like that. So, so those are ones that we've, we're, we're keeping a close eye on uh, if we're consistently able to find good homes for all the babies. Um, they're also one where our, our female just seems dead set on drowning us in babies every year <laughs> because she just has these huge healthy clutches, which is great. But, you know, you know, last year we had 14 baby hunter and milk snakes that needed homes and they're not in the highest demand. So that's one that if we ever got the sense that we're we're struggling a bit to find the kind of homes we want where we would just stop breeding them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I always tell this story in the podcast, so, so the regular listeners will have heard it a million times, they're probably rolling their eyes, but one of the things that when I first got into reptiles, it was, you know, it's, is when, once you start buying snakes, the fir- like you're saying, the sort of the first step after is like getting into breeding. All of a sudden, yeah, that's sort right. of the norm. Yeah. Like you want to get into it. So I have these two boas, and I'm like, oh, I could breed them in a few years. And I just have this moment on the, on Kijiji. There was this litter of boas that was just there for months and months, and was constantly being refreshed. And it was the prices were constantly dropping. And actually, now that I think about it, I, I only had one snake at the time, and I just saw this litter over and over and over again. And that really made me realize that. These animals aren't being moved, and then it turned out that one of the boas that I ended up rescuing about a year later was one of those boas from that litter that I had oh. seen that was just reoccurring. <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah. when I really realized people just kind of breed because it's fun and it's engaging, but you really have to be careful. And I, I love the way that you guys are going about it. You have to do that research first, and like you said, they're almost sort of theoretically spoken for before they hit the ground right. in a way. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's the way to do it. So. As far as your enclosures go, let's talk about that because everything behind you is hand built, which is yes. pretty amazing. So tell me about that project. Yeah, so um, so I always grew up uh, with a father who could make anything, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, and so I have always kind of been, uh, well, if I can make it myself, why am I going to pay so much more to buy it? <laughs> kind of person. So. Um, so I, I I bought my very first snake enclosure, that animal plastics for my ball python, uh, which is beautiful. And but but I got it and I kind of put it together and I looked at it and I thought, well, you know, I still have to fill it up and I still have to decorate it and turn it into an actual home for her. So so I'm kind of looking at this box and I thought, well, gee, I can make this. <laughs> so um, for the Brettles python, I I made him a little two by two by three foot cage to put them in. And I had no idea how fast he'd outgrow that. Um, But, and then, and then I went on to making him a a five by two by three. And, um, and I put the Japanese rat stick in the smaller one. And, and I had this little wall of cages that just looks so nice to me. And, uh, and so when, when Andrew and I got together, you know, I'm looking at almost 50 snakes and well, more at the time, but big picture, we knew we were looking at about 50 snakes. And, and I just thought, well, you know, this is going to just bankrupt us <laughs> if we have to buy cages. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, and, and, and I can't keep them any other way. So, so we started making a few and, and then uh, we're fortunate, uh, fortunate enough to have a big house. Um, we have two reptile rooms and some stacks just scattered throughout the house. Um, it pretty much looks like a zoo. <laughs> um, That's great. Yeah, but, you know, we just started 
slapping together some plywood boxes and I start, yeah, I watched some of Francis's videos on making backgrounds. And that was actually something that I was really interested in was um, the decorations on the inside. You know, you make the box, it's basically the same process every time. What I wanted to do is try different backgrounds. I did the, the super realistic ones and I love how it looks, but it's a lot of work. Um, it's messy as hell. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then I started going, um, I started going to something like the ones behind me are, uh, this side is sheets of foam and I just kind of scorched it with a butane torch and then painted them. And this side has no actual background. It's just painted. Mm. And now I've gone back to, um, a little bit more of a background, but not super realistic, but so yeah, it's, um, Building the cages from scratch to me is just, it's cost effective. Yes. But it's also just a lot of fun. Yeah. You can, you can tailor it to, to the individual snake that'll be going in there. Um, and it, it, the way you guys do it, it almost just, it almost looks like you're just building a shelf. Like you have the sort of plywood structure, almost like a massive bookshelf in a way. And then you just, so what are you using to seal the inside? Is it some sort of paint or what do you yeah. so for so that's kind of changed along the way and there's lots of lessons learned along the way um yeah. uh i've always kind of been of the mindset that i i don't fully trust just a sealer on wood which is not you know it's not logical <laughs> if you use the right sealer but i i like a physical barrier over the floor especially so what i initially started doing was just using uh polyethylene sheeting along the bottom as a liner and I would seal the wood underneath that too, but I would, I would use that liner. And then the backgrounds are fully enclosed with spray foam. Um, nowadays, dry lock is usually what I use. Um, it's very cost effective, works really well. You just paint um, the whole inside with dry lock or that's mainly the yeah. floor? Yeah, so I do the whole inside um, and then I'll usually seal over that, yes. Uh, but truth be told, most of my cages are very dry. Um, yeah. I keep a lot of species that don't need high humidity. So, uh, I, they all have their humid hides and, and, and I seal the floor to me. The most important part is the floor because I like the ability to just dump water in a cage when they need a humidity boost. You know, I have mm -hmm. deep substrate. So I like being able to just tip over their water dish and, yeah. uh, and wet the, the substrate without worrying about the floor of the cage. But, uh, but yeah, so I think, I think the last stack that I did was mostly dry lock so with, a, many... with, a, with a foam floor. Sorry. It's, I, I like to use, um, half inch foam sheeting over the entire floor, just one solid piece. Um, how, how, what's that for? Well, so what I found was that I was kind of wondering down the line, I'm hoping these cages last a long time. Yeah. <laughs> what I kind of sure found is that I was wondering down the line. Um, you know, if I were to ever rearrange branches or something and, and scrape the finish of the floor or something by accident, I was just kind of wondering, you know, at what point would I notice that? <laughs> um, so what I like about the foam is it, it insulates from the heat, uh, between the cages for, uh, cages with warmer bulbs in them, but also just kind of like the extra security that it gives, you know, it's such a, it's this, it's this big, strong barrier that nothing's going to dent through it. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably overkill, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with that. I'd rather go overkill. <laughs> exactly. So how, how many cages have you built to this point? Like how many are in your home right now? Um, oh, uh, pro I think 25. So that's a, that's a lot. That's a lot of work. It's about half. <laughs> so another half to go. Yeah. At the moment we have 47 snakes and I think we're planning on getting two or three to round up the group. Uh, so about 50 will be the final number. And what about the doors? Are those acrylic or yeah. how you, how are you doing the doors? Yeah. So they're just framed, uh, plexi. Oh, okay. So yeah. So, so easy. yeah. So in a perfect world, I would probably do sliding glass. Um, there are pros and cons of both. I do like uh, hinge doors. Um, I like it because you can open the whole front of the cage at once. Um, I had sliding doors on my uh, animal plastics enclosure, and I do like them. Um, it's just 
kind of expensive <laughs> for it's this really many expensive. pieces. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a fortune. Yeah. So we ended up uh, buying a, a big bulk order of Plexi cut to the right sizes. And was that was that really expensive? Whenever I've looked for plexiglass here in Canada, it's been pretty pricey. Like I did a plexiglass yeah. store on my carpet python, and it cost me like it was I think it was like a hundred dollars for this sheet, and I had to cut it down. So what was it for you guys? Yeah, so we found this company that was pretty reasonable. So so first of all, because these are framed and we don't we we don't go over a certain size, uh, we use eighth inch plexi, so yeah. it's pretty thin. Um, uh you know, plans change over time and we're definitely going to be a couple short, but for most of it, I think it was about $1,400. Wow. For the that's whole actually month. not bad. It's not that bad. Yeah. It was a big number, but overall it's not that bad. Would you guys ever consider doing like a YouTube channel or anything to highlight everything that you've done? Yeah. We've been meaning to for about a year and a half. <laughs> you got to do it. I always, yeah. when I find people like yourselves, I like try to promote it because we need more people like that on YouTube to show that this type of stuff is possible. Yeah. Yeah. I love to, and I keep, I keep meaning to, um, maybe this will give me the kick to do it, but, um, I keep meaning to, because I really like, you know, Andrew is working on his PhD. He's, he's quite busy, but I am about a half time artist at this point. And the rest of the time is spent on the animals. And I just, I love taking videos of them and pictures of them. And I, I, I've never wanted it to be my full-time job. Um, I think that would conflict with the with how much I enjoy it. I think it would uh, turn it into a job, and I don't want that. But um, yeah, I, I would love to have another way to to put them out there and try to be a good influence. <laughs> yeah, well, I like I said, we need more like that, and I, I really hope you do. I mean, maybe I'll. I'll kind of poke poke at you a few times until yeah, you do it yeah. <laughs> because I think it would be really cool and and especially yeah. highlighting other species which is so needed right now especially in North America. I don't know if it's like, you know, Europe they seem to have a little more species diversity and we do have species diversity here. It's just not on the forefront of the hobby when you go on YouTube or anything. You know, so obviously corns and ball pythons are, you know, these are our staples. Are there any animals snakes that you guys have that would work to re- not replace, but work as similar to a corn or a ball python that would be great for beginner that you think, why aren't these out there? Yeah. So Baird's rats are the first one I can think of. Um, we have three and uh, generally I think they have a little bit more spice than a corn snake. Although I say that um, and we we have two corn snakes right now and our female Okatee actually has plenty of spice. Um <laughs> But I think bears in general, what I what I actually love about them is they're they just love rattling their tails. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> and you know, it's like our one female, she'll she'll musk, but in general, they're really sweet snakes and um really comparable to corns in a lot of ways, in size and temperament in general, um and in cage size and in care and everything. So they're ones that I really, I really don't know why we don't see more of them. Um, I would say Russian rats just because of their temperament, but I do, I know why I hesitate sometimes to recommend them for a beginner is that I, I personally think that they should be brumated. Mm. So that's kind of a, it's, it's not hard, but it's kind of an intimidating thing as a first snake or something. Um, as far as Pythons, we only have, we have the ball python and our bread, our brettles pythons and brettles are obviously a good bit bigger. Right. Um, but if someone is looking for a bigger python, I, I can't recommend them enough. They're fantastic. Um, other beginners, you know, the milk snakes, the black milks in general, milk snakes are a little bit flighty, but the black milks, they come out of the egg, like, hi, how are you doing? <laughs> They're just. <laughs> They're so sweet. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So as far as brumation goes, then are you how are you guys pulling off brumation? Do you pull them out and put them in tubs somewhere mm-hmm. or, or what do you do? Yeah, so we have a wine cooler oh, okay. um, that we use and we're going to need a second one now. But um, uh, yeah, we pull them out, we put them in their brumation tubs and they just, uh, the cooler's in a closet so it's nice and dark. And uh, I think the plan, the plan now is to kind of, uh, improve the way we do seasonal cycling with the ones who need an actual brumation. So, you know, we're aware that our Russian rats are 
one of the species that needs the the coldest brumation. If our Russian rats are above 50, they start to lose weight. So um, at the same time, we've always brumated our bairds along with them and other species too. Our, our northern water snake usually wants to be cooled. So he goes right in there with them. And they're fine at those temperatures, but they don't need them. They don't need it that cold. Um, so I think the plan is that we're going to try to do two wine coolers with different temperatures. Mm, so, uh, yeah, kind of try to try to get them more in their natural range of temperatures than uh, one size fits all. Yeah. And I guess that is one of the weird, yeah, if, if you do have a species that really should be brumated, it's probably not the best for a beginner because it's sort of like, why would I put my snake, my pet well, snake right. in a fridge for four months? Yeah. Oh yeah. And you miss them. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. What, what species do you, are you and your husband drawn to? Because you, you, you sort of have a bunch of random things in a way. Is there certain things that you get drawn to or, or what are you guys looking for? Well, so basically what we look for is uh, an active snake. We like snakes that are out and about. Um, um, and it's not that we don't like the more sedentary species. Like our Demerals is one of our favorites and she barely moves. <laughs> um, she's always visible though, which I love about her. She'll just kind of hide right under the substrate. and You'll see her face and her tail. She likes to try to lure us in. She does her little <laughs> tail. Yeah. Oh, um, cool. It's so cool. Um, but mostly active colubrids is what we like. Um, something something that tends to be more confident. Um, there's a lot of species that I would theoretically love to have, but then, you know, you read that they're a little more nervous um, or reclusive. And part of me always wonders with species like that, like, do I feel great about keeping them in captivity anyways? Because to me, part of, to me, part of, uh, feeling like my snakes are comfortable is them not being freaked out all the time. <laughs> yes. So yeah, when my Russian rat sits there with her, you know, out on her branches and watches me clean the door of her cage and just watches me and isn't bothered to me, I feel like I'm not bothering her. <laughs> and I'm not, you know, stressing her out. So, so confident species, active species, um, just something that's usually when we fall in love with a new species, it's something different from what we have um with the exception of north american rat snakes i have a little bit of an obsession with them <laughs> um but something like uh you know our false water cobra was probably the last really different snake that we got she's very different <laughs> how did you guys get onto that train yeah so we've really been interested in um possibly cribbos um something big and heavy bodied. We were, we're crazy about our black milk snakes and our females a little on the smaller side, our males a good six feet. And he's just such an impressive snake when you interact with him. And so we've been looking for something heavier bodied. And, um, and so I was, I, I made a post somewhere asking, you know, black tail cribbo or false water cobra, which way do I go here? And, um, Zach, um, how does he say his last name? Lachman? Oh, Loafman. Loafman. Loafman, yeah. Zach Loafman, yes. Zach Loafman. He sent me I a message. Zach was involved in this. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, he sent me a message and he had said um, that he was going to have a lot of babies and and he liked the way they kept our snakes. So so he offered me one. So that's how we ended up with Tempest. Um, her name is, her name's appropriate. She is, oh, <laughs> she's, she's wild, but I love her. <laughs> yeah. Anybody I hear that talks about working with a false water cobra is just like they are so different than anything. They're fast moving. They're constantly yeah. watching you. And she's yeah. I you know I used to think I knew what an attentive snake looked like. Um, and you know it's funny because I see a lot of people talking about what's the most intelligent species of snake. And my problem with that discussion is it usually ends up with the answers basically saying what's the most visual species of snake, which isn't a measure of intelligence. Um, so we have a lot of really visual snakes who will watch you carefully, but I don't, I don't actually think there's that much going on up there. <laughs> um, yeah. They're just, in, they're just, vis they're seeing the movement. In front yeah, of them. exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, um, so I was kind of thinking with the false water cobras, you know, they're going to be a very visual species and, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't really expect them to blow me away and, you know, she does things sometimes, I don't know how smart she is, but she does things sometimes where 
I've never seen any of our snakes do it. Um, and the way she watches me, um, the other day I was in here cleaning the room and I looked up and she was just watching me with her head tilted. And when I walked up to the cage, she kind of tilted it even more. And like, just the way she was looking at me, it's just, it feels different than any other snake I've had. Yeah. Have and the way had, she interacts. Is she any, any aggression or anything? Well, so she's never bit me, but that's only because uh, I started with gloves with her. She mm -hmm. tried to bite me once. There was one handling session where she just tried to tear my gloves to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I could actually feel her teeth through the gloves. She had some sharp little teeth and she was just a baby. But uh, so she, she's pretty dramatic. Um, but, you know, for all the drama, I, I started going gloveless with her probably, uh, probably two months after getting her because I just, you know, she, she tail whipped me. They definitely do that. That was not an exaggeration when people talked about them tail whipping. <laughs> um, and it's a lot of weight behind that tail whip. She can really get you. Um, but she, she's very dramatic when you initially take her out, she'll flatten her whole body. It's not even just a hood. It's like her whole body pancakes. Uh, and, uh, but what I started noticing was as, as dramatic as it was and as intimidating as it was at first, she wasn't actually trying to bite me. Um, she never really did anything besides make a big fuss. And then the second I got her out, she just calmed right down. She was like, you know, they feel kind of like big bean bags. They're so heavy <laughs> yeah, yeah. and they don't really grip on. Um, but yeah, no, she's, she's one of my favorites for sure. So how aquatic does that species need to be kept? Well, so this is another thing that I think is, a, a it's very individual with each snake because um, she's always had the option to soak and swim, nothing over, you know, nothing huge, but she's always had a water dish big enough for her to fit in and swim around in. And, and uh, she hasn't really shown uh, any preference to be in the water. Um, even from when she was a baby, she would kind of go in there and get a drink after a meal. That's usually when I see her in there is after a meal, she'll go get a drink and soak for a couple minutes and then leave. But um, I definitely see some individuals who just seem to spend all their time in their water. So I think that's probably a case of give them the option and see what they do. Yeah. Yeah. That um, makes sense. For her, she, Yeah. She'll always have the option, but um, she's definitely not too much of a swimmer. So tell me a little bit about that 14 foot enclosure design that you guys have in your head right now. What's that going to look like? Yeah. So uh, that's going to be downstairs um, in what was supposed to be a dining room, but uh, yeah, I'd rather <laughs> have a bunch of snake cages. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So we had originally planned a stack of two uh, seven foot stacks side by side. Um, so that was going to be for all our big guys. That was going to be for our brettles, uh, our demarals. And um, I think we had put space in there for uh, either a pair of cribbles or a pair of false water cobras. And then we ended up deciding just to try out the one <laughs> before we decided to get a pair. And, you know, we kind of reworked that wall a couple times. And then after seeing Tempest in her already huge cage for her size as a baby, I just, I kind of looked at it and, you know, seven feet is usually about the size of an adult female. so. Following the length rule, a seven foot cage should be fine for her as an adult. But after watching her, I just had this nagging feeling in my head that this, I'm not going to be happy seeing her in a seven foot cage. Mm -hmm. um, so we decided just to uh, readjust and her cage is going at the bottom across both seven foot stacks now. So that's going to be quite a project. <laughs> and then as, as far as height, does she just need a couple of feet? Like they don't, they're not going to climb too much? She actually is always off the ground. Oh, she weird. is. Yep. She is. Uh, so she's in a two foot cage now. Uh, she initially started in that cage right there, which has my speckled king now. And it's only um, 15 inches tall, I think, which is the shortest cage you've ever built. And so she started in there as a baby. And I noticed she was just off the ground all the time. So she's in a two foot cage now. And she has a couple shelves up. Uh, with a bunch of plants on top of it. And she sits up there all the time. Um, she's actually, I wouldn't say she's graceful on branches, but <laughs> if, <laughs> if you, she's never fallen off. I've never seen her fall, but uh, again, what we're talking about with the, the branching structure and how to place them in the cage, 
what I'm finding is if she has more of a platform of even small branches, she'll just glide right on top of them. So her cage, we're planning on giving her three feet of height. Um, okay. Yeah. So uh, she's going to have a good amount of substrate in there, but uh, she, she doesn't burrow at all that I've seen. So it's mostly for just humidity retention. But um, so most of that's going to be climbing space for her. So that will be an impressive enclosure. That's, that's I can't wait to see that. I'm the next project that we're doing is like, this is the first reptile room that's done. And the next project is the other reptile room, which is mostly smaller cages. And we want to get that one done first, but I'm, I'm so excited to get going on those big ones. I've heard Zach say that the false water cobras can be really messy. Is that true? Well, so interestingly enough, I think I'm feeding her um, a touch lighter than other people do. Um, she's growing at a ridiculous rate already, but, um, I feed her frequently. She's still on every five days. I think she's 10 months old now. She's still on every five days, but I give her pretty small meals. Um, and interestingly enough, I was feeding her heavier as a young baby. And then, then I was finding that she was, you know, she doesn't really paint. Well, I guess she paints on the substrate, <laughs> which is fine, but <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, she kind of just leaves, uh, it's definitely different than other snakes, but um, nothing crazy. But I found that as I'm cutting her food back a little bit, you know, while she's still growing uh, at a ridiculous rate, um, her waist is becoming much less. So yeah. um, I don't find her too bad. You know, after you feed her a bunch of fish, uh, you can smell it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the worst I found is frog legs, actually. That oh, really? Was, like oh, for waist wise? Oh yeah, that was, so she gets, um, she gets rodents, mice, rats at this point. Um, and then, uh, quail, dale, uh, chickens and a lot of fish. She loves fish. Um, I try to, I, I don't think I've ever given her a meal that doesn't have at least some whole prey in it. So she loves, uh, you know, those whole silver sides, um, you can get from pet stores frozen sometimes. Uh, she gets a bunch of silver sides and salmon and tilapia. And that's like, you know, it's fishy, but it's not that bad. I also, I'm going to have a water snake too. So it's not any worse than him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, first time I gave her frog legs, that, <laughs> that was like nothing I've ever seen. Funny enough. She actually, so she has a little feeding tray that I like to put the food in because she's so aggressive with food that she would just fling it around the whole cage. And I don't tongue feed her that that's like a death wish. Um, so <laughs> I, I put it, I, I had left her feeding tray in there and she somehow managed to aim. So she went to the bathroom on a feeding tray, which was really nice, but I was really shocked. Like it was mostly water. It looked yeah. like, but it stunk so bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was horrendous. See, that's the joys of owning a snake like that. Well, I've seen oh, yeah. videos of her eat and it's just like, yeah. It almost looks like it's in fast forward. She's just like inhaling food, just like walking the teeth over the, f it's crazy. I got to take another video for her. Cause she, I mean, first of all, she's, she's probably eight times the size of that video at that point. But yeah, she, she's really entertaining to watch hunt down her food. Cause I just put it in there and I back away as fast as I can. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what a what a unique species. So as far as future projects, you've kind of mentioned you're going to be working on the second room. I'm going to say that hopefully a YouTube channel will start in the next few months. We're just going to say that. Yeah. And is there anything else that you guys have on the go that you that you have as far as future plans go or future species you're going to bring in? Um, well, so the ones we're planning on this year are bull snakes. We don't have okay. any bull snakes at the moment, oh, which cool. is like a bit of a crime. But uh, yeah, so we got uh, for sure a pair of bull snakes coming from a local breeder friend. So that'll be nice. Um, other than that, we pretty much have what we'd like for the foreseeable future. If there comes a point in time where we move somewhere that has a, you know, a basement or something with a, a bigger, uh, space, I would still love to try Kribos. Um, but I, I know I'm not going to be happy unless I have huge cages for them. So I'm not even looking right now. Um, we just got our second pair of, uh, the Brynanax Celenotis. So I'm just crazy about them. Um, what what species is that? That's the Neotropical bird eating snake. Oh, that's the that's oh yeah yeah okay, yeah, yeah yeah. So yeah, <laughs> um, 
Yeah, Somebody else another... was telling me about those. I'm just trying. I'm forgetting. Someone on the podcast has brought them up before. I just don't remember who they were. And I, I, I know I've looked at pictures of them. They, they are really unique. They're, they're very cool. They're, they're the first species where I, you know, I love them all. I love, I've always said like, there are a lot of species I don't want to keep just because I'm not super passionate about them, but I love them all for their own reasons. But yeah, the Friday nights were the first ones where I just, just, I was like, oh, this is what it feels like to click with a species. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. This is what it feels like. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. But, uh, yeah. Other than that, I don't think there's, it's been nonstop building cages and, you know, moving yeah, everyone you just up. Have to, you have to eventually just sit back and look at all the work you guys have done. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's nice even just now because there's, you know, this reptile room, there's, there's no furniture in it. I moved a chair in here now for this, but <laughs> normally there's no furniture in here. So I'm just kind of sitting, looking around going, this is kind of nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I love the setup. Yeah. I mean, it, it, like you said, it, it's like a zoo in your home. And I think yeah. the, the way in, in, not in a negative way, it's like you, you see the enclosures look like a zoo. It's like, oh, it's yeah. really, really beautiful. And, and, uh, I think you're a great role model for the hobby. Is there anything that we didn't cover today that you thought you wanted to touch on? Do we, I think we hit almost everything. Yeah, I think that's, that's all I can think of. Awesome. Well, Chelsea, thank you so much. Can you let everybody know where they can find more information about yourself as well as the smoldering serpents, smoldering serpents? Yeah, we have a a Facebook page and an Instagram page, hopefully a YouTube channel. Yes, we'll (laughs) get you there. Yeah. But both of those resources, the the Facebook and and Instagram, you have some awesome photos there. So I'll I'll direct people there for now and then we'll have our fingers crossed to have a a room tour at some point on the video. That would be awesome. Thank you so much. This was an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Yeah, thanks. (laughs) All right, that is the end of that one. Chelsea, thank you so much for jumping on an episode. I absolutely enjoy listening to all the information that you shared, and I know the listeners will have as well. As always, if you're looking for the show notes on this episode, make sure you head to the description in the YouTube box or head to animalsathomenetwork.com. Click on the Animals at Home header, and there you'll find this episode tile, and there you'll find the links to Chelsea and the Smoldering Serpents Instagram and Facebook page. If you enjoyed the show and want to show your support, definitely share it on Facebook and Instagram or head to animalsathome.ca slash shop and pick yourself up a t-shirt or a sweater. Or you can head to patreon.com slash animalsathome if you want to join us over there to have early access to episodes or the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests. Thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you are in the market for a new reptile enclosure, make sure you head to the links in either the YouTube description box or on the show notes at AnimalsAtHomeNetwork.com. That is an affiliate link, so if you do purchase an enclosure, a commission does come back to me, which of course helps support the show, and I greatly appreciate that. Okay, that's the end of that episode, guys. I will talk to you next Sunday. Have a great week.